All right, welcome everybody to History of Money, Professor Barth, History Professor at Arizona State University. We are now at Lecture 12, and today we're going to examine the global silver trade with Asia, including Japan, China, India, the route around the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean, as well as the Pacific silver trade. And then for part B, we will take a look at a new economic theory, a new economic worldview called mercantilism. That will come in part B. And then we'll also introduce this principle and the theory of colonization in the early modern period and the economic rationale behind having colonies. So we left off last time looking at the Ottoman Empire and reminded ourselves that the Ottoman Empire remains a formidable power into the first half of the 17th century. Look at that sprawling empire. Covers North Africa, the Levant, Asia Minor, Southeast Europe, the uh, areas surrounding the Red Sea, the Eastern Mediterranean. And so as long as trade routes are still going over land, the Ottoman Empire is going to remain central to these international trade networks. The Cape Route, which was first traveled by Vasco da Gama in 1498, is long, it's expensive. Very few vessels are, are using that route to trade with the East. And this is why Columbus ventured west across the Atlantic to try to find a, a shorter route to Asia. Of course, he uh, discovered an entirely new continent. And it's also why many of the explorers into the early 17th century are looking for what they uh, called the Northwest Passage, which, which was this supposed passage to get to Asia where you would go uh, north of Canada, but just south of the North Pole, and that would give you a real quick direct route to Asia, and, and Europeans just never stumbled mm -hmm. upon that. And so the overland routes are still very important. By the 17th century, however, the Cape Route, as it was called, the route around the continent of Africa to India, becomes much more uh, heavily trafficked as the Dutch and English get in the game. And I'm gonna look at these two corporations, very, very powerful companies that emerge in the 17th centuries and, and flourish into the 18th centuries. The Dutch East India Company and the English East India Company by the 17th century, instead of just maybe five vessels going around the Cape of Good Hope every year. We have about 70, 80, 90, close to 100 vessels every year making that voyage. And so the Dutch and the English begin to break that Ottoman hegemony between Western, uh, Western trade and Eastern trade. But it will that won't happen for a while. And so the Ottomans will remain a, a formidable power. However, by the end of the 17th century, into the 18th century, the Ottomans are in a noticeable decline from the 17th through 19th century, so that by the early 19th century, the Ottomans were nicknamed the sick man of Europe. Remember, they have European, they have territory in Southeast Europe because it was evident to all that the Ottoman Empire was not anywhere remotely close to what it used to be in the 16th century. And this was not only due to new trade routes. It was also due to just lackluster leadership, poor finances. The Ottoman military just was unable to keep up to some of the technological advancements made by European various military or various European militaries. And then the Ottomans ultimately decided to side with Germany in World War I. Not a good, not a wise decision, and that was the end of the Ottoman Empire. So it's a it's a long decline, sort of like the Spanish Empire, but by the seventeenth by the late seventeenth century, the decline is is evident. Okay, so the title of, of of this part A is the global silver trade with Asia, 
And in a previous lecture, a little ways back, we looked at what historians have called the silverization of China. China, as you'll recall, had a coinage, but it was a copper coinage. They called cash coins. China has an abundance of copper mines. And China also had a fiat paper currency. Well, as you'll remember from that previous lecture, the Chinese paper money hyperinflated beginning in the 15th century, around the 1450s. And within a few decades, the Chinese paper money had become all but worthless. Now the Ming Empire, the Ming Dynasty, did not have a silver coinage. There's not as many silver mines in China and the Ming resisted this move towards silver. However, with a now worthless paper money and cash coins just unable to do the business that many Chinese merchants want, Chinese merchants outside of the state grab hold of silver and begin using silver as their favorite medium of exchange. And you'll remember this image from that lecture, the, these silver bars and there are some Chinese markings on them. And so all of a sudden, this massive country, which at the time contained about one quarter of the world's population, think about that, one quarter of the world's population is in China in the 16th century, begins moving very rapidly toward a silver currency and the demand for silver shoots up in China. So there's a major demand for silver in China right at the same time that these silver discoveries are made in the Americas, Potosi, parts of Mexico, other parts of Central and South America. But the Americas were not the only source of silver in the 16th century. In Japan, there was a major silver discovery in the 1540s. And this, uh, this discovery was made at Iwami, the Iwami Mines. And you'll see here in the red, the location of the Iwami Mines and a very, very abundant source of silver opened up in the 1540s. And for a, a century long period, from these mines in Japan, 8,000 tons of silver produced. Now that's a little less than half of what's being produced in the Americas. So it doesn't match the Americas, but that's still a huge amount. Remember in, in the year 1500, the entire world supply of silver, the whole world supply of silver in 1500 was about 35,000 tons. So if you have 8,000 tons coming from the Iwami mines in Japan alone, that's a huge amount. And so Japan became the world's second largest silver producer after the 1540s. And a major trade opens up between this Japanese silver supply and the rest of Asia. The question is, who's going to oversee this trade of Japanese silver to China? So you have this major demand for China one quarter of the world's population. The sudden demand for silver in China. And then the sudden silver discovery in Japan. Who will oversee that trade? The Ming don't yet have the requisite merchant sea power in order to oversee all this trade. And there are some complications in the relations between diplomatic relations between the Japanese and the Chinese. Japanese and Chinese historically have not gotten along very well. And so a European power jumped in and oversaw this trade between China and Japan. And at first in the 16th century, that power was Portugal. So you'll remember it was the Portuguese who conducted the first explorations down the coast of Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope. And so the Portuguese lay claim to what was called the East Indies. And the East Indies was basically the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea, and parts of the South Pacific. And the Portuguese initially dominated this trade in the East Indies. 
remember the, the Chinese in the early 15th century had ships. They had a navy in the Indian Ocean. It would have been you know, really interesting historically to see what would have happened if when the Portuguese entered the Indian Ocean, they met Chinese ships. What, you know, what would that have looked like? That's all counterfactual history because the Ming Empire destroyed all the all of the ships, the maps, all of it, and turned inward. And so the Chinese were were not present in the Indian Ocean when the Portuguese come. So for the Portuguese, it's fair game, and they just jump in and function as middlemen. Remember, middleman is is a tradesman or a merchant who who buys from the producer and then sells to the consumer at a profit. Buying Japanese silver, so the Portuguese went to Japan, sold some, some European manufactured goods to the Japanese for silver, bought that Japanese silver and then sold it to the Chinese for luxury goods, namely silk. Huge demand in Europe for silk. And the Portuguese dominate this trade for a few decades. They worked out a deal with the Japanese shogun. The shogun was a hereditary military governor ran into some problems uh, with the Jap with Japanese officials, primarily for their missionary work. The Portuguese spread their uh, Catholic faith to Japan, and, and actually for a period, Japan was the had the largest uh, was the largest Catholic country outside of Europe. Uh, Catholicism like took over Japan for a few decades, and, and the Japanese shogunate didn't like that one bit and began persecuting Japanese Christians and then tossed out the Portuguese because they saw the Portuguese as as encouraging insurrection and, and as encouraging bad ideas that threatened the status quo in Japan. And so when the Portuguese were thrown out by the shogunate in 1639, the shogunate invited the Dutch in and the Dutch moved the Dutch East India Company, which I'll look at a little more uh, in a moment, the Dutch East India Company dominated this trade for a good two decades and, and traded silver between Japan, or bought Japanese silver, sold it in, in China. And it was a very successful trade for the Dutch so that the Dutch East India Company was able to access all of these Chinese goods without having to export one ounce of silver from the Netherlands, from Holland. They got, they got all their silver from Japan, sold it, in China for those goods. Very, very profitable trade. This trade in turn <laughs> abruptly ended in after the 1660s as the shogunate began to despise not only the foreign influence, foreign cultural influences, but actually also began to regret some of the silver trade and, and didn't like it one bit. And, and at this point, the Japanese completely adopted a uh, uh, isolation and for a good two centuries uh, completely secluded itself from from the outside world and so that ended that epic but for a good century Japan is uh, again the second largest silver producer and played a major role in in this global silver trade Japan will be opened up again in the 1850s so for but for two centuries Japan is dominated by what uh, people in the 21st century would call xenophobia and and after 1850s once they opened up then Japan did a complete 180 and fully embraced western values and western technology and western industry and became a major power within a few decades anyway that's a whole nother story but for a good century Japan was uh, deeply involved in the game but a lot of silver is coming co going to China from the Americas. So this was another route. So you have the Japanese silver trade, which, which flourishes for about one, a, a full century. First, the Portuguese and the Dutch, and then you have what was called the Pacific silver trade. And this silver trade from Acapulco, Mexico, which is on the Pacific coast of Mexico, silver, from Mexican mines and also from a cruise not on the map here, but Potosi, who have had silver galleons going up to Mexico and then from Acapulco crossing these giant galleons crossing the Pacific Ocean and then landing in Manila 
the capital city of the Philippines, which at this time was a Spanish colony. The Philippines will be a Spanish colony all the way up through 1898, the Spanish-American War. Cross the Pacific, land in the Philippines, and then from the Philippines, trade with China. Trade with China. And, and then back from the Philippines to, to Mexico. Very big route. And as a result, Spanish dollars, the piece of eight, the peso, became quite common in Chinese port cities like Canton and uh, what the region was later Hong Kong. Spanish pieces of eight that were minted in Peru and in Mexico City are commonly used in many of these Chinese port cities. So just super fascinating. I mean, what we have here is, again, the birth of global trade, birth of globalization, you may say, right? And uh, pretty incredible, given how just a couple centuries ago, all these regions were completely isolated from one another. You remember one of the earlier maps where the map maker, the Italian map maker, and I don't fault him at all, but you know, in the 15th century, just China and India are just way off. I mean, it, it doesn't look anything like they actually truly did, the map that is. Uh, now, I mean, the whole world's been opened up, and this is an extremely profitable trade. There is immense profit in selling this, whether it's Japanese silver or American silver, and selling it to the Chinese. And by the way, this Pacific silver trade for Spain was one of the few bright spots uh, for the Spanish economy during this time. I mean, we, we already dealt with the Spanish inflation, but this was one of the one of the areas in which Spain actually is uh, 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 participating in some in a quite thriving and enriching trade, and then otherwise. bad economic time period for Spain. A little silverization of China, but that wasn't all. India, silverization of India. Now India for centuries has had used silver, but in the, what was sort of the late middle ages, there was a decline in the use of silver coin. And then in this period in the 16th century, a new, empire is formed in india and this was the mughal empire I actually thought i had it um, uh, spelled on one of the slides here but i don't the spelling is m-u-g-h-a-l the mughal empire and the mughal empire was a persian speaking islamic empire or uh, uh, ruler persian speaking islamic ruler that governed over this vast territory and in the 16th century introduced a new silver coin called the rupee, the rupee. And of course the rupee remains the common uh, unit of account in India. And you see the different symbols on, on that coin again, reflecting Mughal values. This was also the age in which the Taj Mahal was erected. Of course, one of the world's most beautiful architectural achievements. And so with the dawn of the rupee, this new silver coin in India, the demand among Indian merchants for silver really begins to shoot up. And so you have a you have China, which has one quarter of the world's population, and then you have India, Mughal India, whose population exceeded Europe and the Middle East combined. Europe and the Middle East combined, India's population exceeds it. Now in this in India as well, massive demand for silver coin. So that this trade with Asia removed up to one third, think about that, one third of all the incoming silver from America to Europe, one third of the incoming silver from America to Europe went straight to India and China, amount to an average of 150 tons 
of silver every year, and that's just from Europe. This trade does not, this figure does not include the Pacific trade or the Japanese trade. So that 150 tons of silver a year is silver that crossed the Atlantic Ocean and then upon coming to Europe, then was removed from Europe to India and, and China. 150 tons a year. If you do the math, that's 2.4 million ounces of silver or roughly 2.4 million pieces of eight Spanish dollars. That is a lot of coin. And this silver, again, whether it's going from across the Pacific or whether it's going this route from, and you follow my mouse here, from Europe around the continent of Africa to the Indian Ocean and then to India or to China, the silver finances the purchase of just quantities of Eastern goods that a generation or two earlier in Europe wouldn't have imagined possible to, to purchase. Um, the Without American silver, This trade with between Europe and India, between Europe and China, you know, would not have been even marginally possible on the scale that that it was that it was conducted. So it's a huge trade, huge trade. And the two companies involved most heavily in this trade by the 17th century, once the, once the Portuguese fade out a bit, are the Dutch and English East India companies. And the Dutch and English East India companies, I should have East there in the, well, I'll just go ahead and add it, are involved in what economists call the re-export trade. So you might say, how did these companies become so, how were they so profitable if all they're doing is shipping, you know, taking silver coin and buying buying silks and cottons and spices and all the rest with that silver coin, doesn't that mean that they're running a huge deficit? Well, what these companies did, they took silver coin, again, mined from the Americas or wherever, or Japan, in the case of the Dutch, they took silver coin, bought those goods in China or in India or in Indonesia, bought those goods and then sold them again, the re-export trade, sold them again to another country or to other buyers at a higher price than what they what the company paid for them so again the, the economic middleman except this time it's a, a whole company sometimes instead of the re-export trade you'll hear this called the carrying trade carrying trade buying goods in one country and then selling it to another country at a higher price for the Dutch, the Dutch specialize in, in Chinese silk, Chinese porcelain. The Dutch are heavily involved in the China, in, in Chinese trade. And then in, in Indonesia with spices, with spices. The Dutch dominate Indonesia, or what at the time was called the Spice Islands. And those spices, those spices and, those, and the Chinese silk are, uh, are luxury items in Europe. And the Dutch East India Company is able to uh, return to Europe with those items and then sell them all over Europe at a very high price. In the English company, by contrast, focus, focuses on India. And in India, we have two different uh, types of uh, goods. Pepper was an Indian specialty, but also cotton. Cotton was a major part of the Indian trade or the trade between England and India, and it was a very profitable trade. And the, both these companies are extraordinarily powerful. Actually, the Dutch East India Company is the most powerful corporation in the world at this time, but the English company is also very, very powerful. And even though it's a private company, it actually begins to assume governing powers in some of the, uh, some of the parts of the Indian coast in which they dominate most. And so, this company, later known as the British East India Company, as they make deals with local Indian princes and or chip away at Indian sovereignty, uh, before you know it, India becomes an outright colony of Britain 
by the 19th century so that the rupee ultimately by the 19th century has not any uh you know mughal persian uh iconography on the coin any longer no it's not going to have hindu iconography on the coin either but rather it will have the visage the face of queen victoria of england still called a rupee still called a rupee but it's clear now who's in charge right it's clear who's in charge remember i i said at the beginning of this course the importance of iconography iconography the coins money can tell you a whole lot about about the country or the area or region in which that money circulates and here what a powerful message Who's the sovereign? Well, Queen Victoria is the sovereign, but it takes a while to get there. That's not until the 19th century. It takes a good 250 years to get there. When the, when the company was first chartered under Queen Elizabeth in the year 1600, you know, it was a, a little more humble, a little more humble. But within a few decades, the East India Company in England, again, one, one of the most powerful companies in the world, right alongside the, the Dutch variant. So we will stop there and... I will see you for part B of lecture 12.